This morning we are going to start reading out of Leviticus chapter 16. Uh, let's see here, was that right? No, I'm sorry. Leviticus 21, starting with verse 16. And we're going to read through verse 21. That will be the main passage of Scripture that we get the idea of our message from. I titled this morning's message, Stain Remover. Uh, essentially, before we even read the passage of Scripture, I put a couple of definitions. I put one definition. Now, these just come out of the English dictionary for stain. And I use this particular, you know, they got one, two, and three. But this is the one I chose because this is the idea. A cause of reproach, a stigma, a blemish, a stain on one's reputation. Now, what I thought about doing for a second, but I was like, eh, I don't want to be like other preachers that I've known in the past. I thought about getting me a stained up t-shirt, taking this one off and walking around and preaching with this stain all over my shirt. The reason why is to make a point. Because stains physically on a shirt would get your attention and make you feel a little bit awkward. Wouldn't they make you feel a little awkward, I think, if the preacher was walking around with this big old nasty looking stain on his shirt. And you would feel awkward walking around in public with a stain on your clothing. Spiritually, stains in our life do the same thing. They make us feel awkward. They make us feel unwelcome. They make us feel like something's just not quite right in the midst of our lives. The, the other uh, definition I have is a blemish, which is similar to a stain, a mark that detracts from appearance, could be a pimple or a scar in a physical sense, a defect or flaw, stain, a blight, a blemish on his record. Okay, so we're going to start reading out of Leviticus chapter 21, starting in verse 16. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever be of thy seed in their generations that has any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that has a blemish, he shall not approach. And then he goes on to list some things. A blind man or a lame. He that has a flat nose or anything superfluous. Now that means uh, more than what it should be. So you know I'm supposed to have a flat nose, but it also doesn't need to be so big that it's bigger than what it ought to be. Or a man that is broken footed, or broken handed, or crook backed, or a dwarf, or that has a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, that's just another way to say itch, or scabbed, or has his stones broken. If you were wondering if that's what it meant, that's exactly what it meant, his stones broken, okay? No man that has a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest, shall come near to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He has a blemish. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. Now, <laughs> to those of us who have studied the Bible, as soon as we hear the terminology sons of Aaron, it should ring something true in our hearts and minds. It should tell us something about the text and what they're actually talking about. It's talking about the priests uh, that would be of Israel. Now, you know, real quick so that we're all on the same page, the, the, the approximate date, and you know, you have different sources that have different dates, but they're somewhere right around this time frame. The approximate date of the Exodus, so that would be after the book of Leviticus would have been written after the Exodus or right around that time frame of the Exodus when the children of Israel were going through the wilderness journey. God was giving them the plans for the tabernacle, giving them the plans for the sacrificial system, giving them the plans for the articles of the tabernacle. 1450 B.C. Now, what we're going to go backwards to about 2000 B.C., which is the time frame of Abraham. So when I, we're, we're trying to get a little bit of an idea of the sons of Aaron, okay, for those of us that may be to make sure that we're all on the same page. We know of the name Abraham. God called Abraham out before there was a nation called Israel, right? He had a son named Isaac. Isaac had two sons, but the one we're focused on is Jacob, okay? Now, these three together are known as the patriarchs. You've ever heard of that word terminology before, the patriarchs? If you've read the Bible, then you should have come across that word before. Uh, the patriarchs are fathers of the faith. These men, before there ever was a nation of Israel, before there ever was uh, the, the, all the prophecies that came from the prophets later that promised that Jesus would come, these were the men that God called, and also to each one of them, he renewed his promises. The promises were originally given to Abraham, but then 
He also renewed the promises to Isaac and also to Jacob. And so therefore, many times in the Bible, whenever God approaches his people again, he'll say, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. That's how he would reveal himself to the children of Israel. Now, Jacob, many of us are, realize, had two wives, but the one that we're going to focus on is Leah. And Leah had four boys right off the bat for Jacob. And the third one, his name was Levi. From Levi, well, these, these sons became the tribes of Israel. That's how, that's how the nation of Israel later on after the exodus would be divided up and how they would inhabit the land in the various tribes that they were. You know, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and, you know, Naphtali, and Ephraim. And, and this is how they were divided. They were divided into tribes, divided into clans, divided into families. And it went down like that. Levi was God's own special people. They didn't receive an inheritance like all of the other tribes did because they belonged specifically to God. Why? Because from Levi would come the ones who would work and do the work of God. Amen. They would, they would carry the tabernacle in the wilderness. They would, they would take care of the furnishings of the tabernacle. And then more specifically, when we get to this time frame here, in this time frame of the Exodus, when what God would say, so the descendants of Levi, two, two brothers, Moses and Aaron. So once again, we're looking at approximately 500 years later, two descendants that were born from Levi's lineage were Moses and Aaron. And God said from Aaron would come the priests. And so you could not be a high priest Unless you came from Aaron. So all of the priests came from the Aaronic lineage. And therefore, and the high priest would also ultimately come from Aaron. Uh, and he would be the one that would be serving the Lord. Serving in the tabernacle. Later on, after David uh, would bring the Ark of the Covenant back. And Solomon would build the temple that would serve in the temple. Specifically in this passage that we're reading in the book of Leviticus. What we're talking about here is the priest. He's saying when any one of the sons of Aaron are going to do the ministry of offering up the bread to the Lord. It's talking about the show bread. Then if he has a blemish in him, he's not to approach the Lord. If he has a blemish, he's not to approach the Lord. If he had a blemish in his skin, a blemish in his eyes, a blemish uh, in his hand, a blemish in his back. If he was stained in any way, shape or form, if he had a spot in him, he was not to approach the Lord. That means he wasn't welcome in the presence of the Lord. Now, you know, the truth be told that um, the priests were really the only ones that were allowed to approach the presence of the Lord. Amen. Uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, of Israel, the whole nation belonged to God. They were God's people, but it was the high priest or specifically the high priest that was able, we know, to go on the day of atonement beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God was. So he was the only one that was allowed to really touch the presence of God or, or experience the presence of God, but he did it for the people, amen, so that the people would be made right with God. And so what I want you to know, though, is that in the New Testament, the blemish of the of the priest prevented him, even though he was born of the right lineage, even though he was born of the right family, the blemish in his life prevented him from being able to access the presence of God. Well, in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, chapter five, verses eight through ten says that believers have been made priests unto God, not only priests, but also kings unto God. It says, and when he had taken the book, now if you go back to the beginning of Revelation 5, and I'm not saying that you have to do that, but if you'll remember the story, um, there was they were looking for anyone who would be worthy to open the scroll that, that, the, that God who sat on the throne had in his hand, and there was no one worthy. And John the Revelator, who wrote the book of Revelation, was, if you'll remember the, that part of the story, he was exiled on the Isle of Patmos for preaching the gospel. He was a prisoner of preaching the gospel, like many of them. We, last week we talked about the fact that the Apostle Paul was in prison for preaching the gospel. And so John the Revelator was on the Isle of Patmos, Patmos and he got a vision. And he wrote down the book of Revelation. Well, in this vision, 
he realized that nobody was worthy. Nobody was worthy to open up the scrolls, and he began to weep. And then they said, why do you weep? One of the elders said, why do you weep? He said, nobody's worthy to open the scrolls. He said, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He is worthy to open the scrolls. And so when he, the lamb, but, but whenever John turned to see a lion, what he saw was a lamb as though it had been slain. And we've talked about that before many times, but I'll say it again. The victory of the lion comes from the fact that he was the sacrificial lamb. The victory that we have in our lives today. Listen, whatever it is that you're going through in your life, it's not really any of my business. I mean, if you want to share it with me, that's fine. We'll pray about it. We'll bring it to the Lord. But it's really not any of my business. The business that you have in your life is between you and the Lord. Amen. But whatever it is, if you're a true believer, if you've truly ex accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then that means that the Holy Spirit has come to live inside of your heart. And when the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart, things are different than the way that they used to be. Amen. Listen, I'm not saying you don't ever do anything wrong, but if you're doing stuff wrong, then you don't feel good about it. You, there's something that's dealing with your heart. Amen. And, and so what you need to know is, is that if those things are still going on in your life, that the answer to that, that the victory of the lion is because of the slaying of the lamb. What are you talking about? Jesus shed his blood because Jesus shed his blood and you put faith in that. There was an exchange that took place. He took your guilt upon him and gave you his righteousness. Because you've been re re a recipient of his righteousness, the free gift of righteousness, you now have access to the presence of God. Hallelujah. In the presence of God, there is victory, there is joy, Hallelujah. there is strength. The Holy Spirit is the one that brings victory in the life of the believer. So wherever you are, whatever it is that you're going through, you need to know that there is victory. Amen. Well, so it goes on to say that he took the book. And the four beasts and the twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So the, a couple of things I want, I want you to see there is I'm always trying to talk to you about the big plan of God. Why? Because I think it's important that we see the Bible from that perspective. Yeah. That God didn't just show up and, and perform this thing in some dark alley somewhere. And that, uh, you know, that we're simple minded and closed minded. And that's what the mindset of many people in the world today is. Christianity is just one version. There's many versions out there. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that he redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. God's plan was that wasn't just for the nation of Israel. That's how it started. That was the seed that started the whole process. When he called Abraham out and he said, I'm going to make a nation out of you. The ultimate promise that was going to be fulfilled was that through that nation, God was going to give us Messiah, Jesus who was going to die for the sins of the world. And it wasn't just for people in South Louisiana who grew up Catholic and then decided that, you know, one day they were going to read the Bible or whatever. I'm not making fun. I'm just being real. It, it wasn't just for people in South Louisiana. No, it was for the whole world. It was for the person that was raised in Buddhism in China. It was for the person that was raised in Islam in Mecca. It was for the person that was raised in Taoism in China or whatever flavor you want to call it. It was for each and every one of them because Jesus came to redeem all peoples, all nations, all tongues, all kindreds. Right. Kindred just means kinfolks. People that it doesn't matter where you come from. Jesus came to die for all of them. Amen. Amen. And to make us priests and kings. Yes, amen. 
Jesus dying on the cross has made us priests. What did, what, what did I even get into all this for? Because what we're talking about this morning in the text that we came from was that there was a stain and we needed a stain removal because the truth is, is that in the Old Testament, the priest was the only one that was able to approach the presence of God, but the stain or the blemish prevented him from being able to enter into the presence of God. And in the New Testament, you and I are considered priests. And one big meaning behind that is that you get to have access to the presence of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You get to have access to the presence of God. God is not so distant and far away that you can't hear your cry. Amen. Jesus shed his blood so that you could come near to him. But just as in the Old Testament, the blemish, the stain. That's why I really, I know I already told most of y'all this, but that's why I really wanted to have a stained up t-shirt on under this. And I was going to pull this off and I was going to make y'all feel real awkward because that's what the blemish does. The blemish in our life, whether it be from the past or whether it be from something after we gave our heart to the Lord, the blemish stands in the way and speaks to us and tells us that we're not worthy to enter into the presence of God. It stays there. It remains there. Sometimes people can never shake the things that they've done in the past. I think I'll put it later in the message. I'll try to skip it when I get there. But this is a good spot to talk about. It. An example maybe would be would be something having to do with my life. You know, um, the Lord has <laughs> forgiven me for the things of my past. But guess what? Some of those things still linger around. As bad as I want them to go away, in the physical, I can't make them go away. After being, uh, after being a Christian for however many years, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that I told you all the story, but this is just an example that, you know, I went through nursing school. I, whenever I, I, I filled out the paperwork to, to, become a, uh, to get into nursing school, I said, have you ever been convicted of anything more than a traffic violation? That's e e no, no, I'm sorry. They said, have you ever been convicted of a felony? That's easy. Check. No. Never been convicted of a felony. Got accused of being a felony. Got arrested for a felony. But, but daddy got me off. Okay. So check no to that. That's easy. Go all the way through nursing school. Graduated with honors. Then I go to take the nursing test and it says, have you ever been accused of, convicted of, arrested for anything more than a minor traffic violation? Uh oh, Houston, we have a problem. Because, yeah. I mean, look, I done been busted for marijuana on more than one occasion, robbery and assault as a 15 year old. I just called a part of the cigarettes, but as a 15 year old, that, that was the dumbest thing I ever did because there was a policeman that was just sitting there. And, uh, but anyway, I've been arrested for a lot of things, got in trouble for a lot of stuff. Fortunately, I'd never been convicted of it. Okay, but now I'm a Christian and the Holy Spirit lives in my heart and they're asking me a straight up question. Yeah. The question is, do you answer yes or no? I had to answer yes. That threw me into a whole nother hour. Next thing you know, I'm sitting in this guy's office who's an addictionologist. And I'm beginning to try to explain to him that Jesus changed my life. He said, son, you used to rob houses. You are a drug addict. You'll always be a drug addict. And nobody, this religion stuff ain't going to help you. I'm recommending that you're going to have to go through this program. Had to go through this long, drawn-out program with the nursing board. Call every morning for a color. Your color's bronze. You call in the morning, your color's bronze. I'm sorry, boss. I got to go walk across the lab street over here to the lab, and I got to go give a sample. And this went on for two years. Guess what? Just the other day. Been a nurse practitioner for 20 years now. Okay? Just the other day, I was going to see. They, I heard that they needed some help in an ER. And so there was a question on this, uh, on this form. And it asked the same kind of thing. And, that, and so, and so when I had, whenever I answered that, they said, oh, well, now we need you to either go see a psychiatrist or a doctor to get clearance to be able to go to work in one of our emergency rooms. After 20 years, my point is, is that sometimes life ain't fair. Sometimes the blemish wants to follow you around and it tries to hang on your back for the rest of your life. But I got good news because while those people might not have, you know, necessarily wanted me to work in their ER because they were concerned and they wanted me to go see a psychiatrist. God opened up a door and he has me in a place where I'm where I'm able to be employed and make good money. Right. And sometimes maybe I just want more than what I'm really supposed to have. 
And, but what I'm saying is, is that God is more than capable of coming through for you and opening up the right doors for you if you will serve him. Amen. But nevertheless, you got to understand many times the world is never going to want you to be able to forget your blemish, never going to want you to be able to forget your stain. You're going to have to learn how to trust the Lord and all of that. But what I'm here to tell you is while the world may see you one way, the Lord sees you completely a different way that there is no stain on you. There is no blemish on you and that you are able to approach and enter in to the presence of God. The blemish prevented the priest from entering the presence of God. Even though he was born of the right descendants, he was born of the right descendants and that he came from Levi and more specifically from Aaron, he had a physical blemish. Something was wrong with his nose, his skin, his back, his hand, something. And he was not allowed to enter into the presence of God. And in the Old Testament, God uses physical things to describe spiritual things. And these blemishes represent the fact that man is stained. He has a stain from sin that prevents him from being able to enter God's presence. Initially, we were stained from Adam. And now we were born in original sin that we received from him. But that's why God gave us a plan of hope. That's why he gave us a plan where we can be born again. If you go to John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. If you've never been truly born again, you know, this is where the idea of being born again comes from in the, in the New Testament. There was a religious leader who was part of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If you don't really know what that means, Israel was a, a, a country that was, uh, its leadership was, were religious in, in the sense that they were the religion of the Jews and their leadership, their political leaders were also religious. And they had two different sects, Sadducees and Pharisees. And um, whenever Jesus came on the scene and started performing miracles, it became real clear that he was, something was up. I mean, whenever you tell the dead to get up and they live, and when you tell the lame to walk and the blind to see and the miracles happen, at some point in time, some, you know, it starts to get people's attention. Um, later on, they would blame it that he was working through the devil. Um, they were trying to do everything that they could to trip him up. But this particular Pharisee, this particular religious leader, whether his buddies sent him, we're not really told. But the Bible says it was nighttime and he went out to go talk to Jesus. It says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. By the way, he got saved for sure. Amen. Amen. He got, Amen. Nicodemus got saved. Praise God. A ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, which means great teacher, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. So he's saying, hey, we know you're from coming from God. We know that you're a teacher coming from God. The miracles that you're performing are, it's obvious that you come from God. But you know, this is what he's approaching Jesus with, but Jesus doesn't even answer his question. Jesus doesn't even give credence to the question. I don't know if y'all ever noticed that before. I know I've said it before, but it always sticks out in my mind that where Jesus goes is somewhere else. He says, this is Jesus' response. He says, um, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He goes on to say later, he says, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. But then he says, in case somebody ever asked you about this, this is my interpretation of it. Then he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. He goes on. As a matter of fact, go to the next verse. Yeah. And then go to the next verse. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. Next verse. The wind blows where it is, where it does, and y'all hears the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Next verse. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto them, Art thou the master of Israel, and knowest not these things? I'm going to have to open up a Bible. So basically, Jesus is having this conversation with him, and Nicodemus, Jesus actually told him, he said, You're the teacher of Israel, and you don't know the things that I'm talking to you about? And he was describing being born again as the wind. You feel it, you hear it, but you don't really know exactly where it comes from. And many times... That's what it's like whenever a man is born again. We don't necessarily understand 
everything connected to it, but the reality of it is, is that, um, is that it, there's a change that takes place. Uh, John chapter three, verse five. He says that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Jesus answered, uh, I want verse five. And Nick, uh, Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The reason that I wanted you to see this particular verse specifically is that some people teach that this is talking about water baptism. Uh, I don't believe that. I do believe that water baptism shows publicly the, the new birth that we have in Christ. Amen? But I believe that what this is talking about is, because if you go back in your Bible and you want to study it later, he, he talks about the fact that he speaks of the flesh, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And in this verse, he's connecting water and spirit. So if you compare water to the other verse, it's going to be connected to flesh and spirit to spirit. What, what, I, what, I want you to, what I'm trying to explain to you is this, is that when you're born of water, nine, nine, over 98% of your body is made out of water. Plus you're suspended in water and amniotic fluid. And when you're born physically in natural birth, you gush forth in water from your mother's womb. So the point being is that when you're born of water, you're born of a physical birth. When you're born of the spirit, you're born of spiritual birth. You're being born again. How is a person born again, in case you were curious? Well, you got to hear the gospel. You got to hear the gospel, the good news that says even though you were born a sinner of Adam in your physical birth, born of water of Adam, you must be born again. You must be born again of Jesus. So when you heard that gospel message and something happened to your heart that you wanted to believe that, then what you needed to do at that point is you needed to respond by faith. See, God did his part. He, believe me, he's been working for a long time. He called a man named Abraham out and he had a son named Isaac and Isaac had a son named Jacob who had 12. 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel who became the nation of Israel and through thousands of years he gave us Jesus and Jesus died on the cross he had no sin he paid the penalty for your sin and now you rush through 2,000 years of human history and it comes to your date your time where you are where you hear the gospel where the seeds planted in your heart and now you have a decision to make you have to take the faith that was given unto you and to make a choice. You're either going to believe or you're not going to believe. And when you were given that opportunity to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, it doesn't just mean believe. Oh, I believe. Like intellectually or cognitively, I believe. The Bible says in the book of James, you believe there's one God, you do well. The devils also believe, yet they tremble. What does that mean? That means that demon spirits know that Jesus was the Son of God. Demon spirits know that Jesus died on the cross. The devils know and believe intellectually that Jesus was real. That doesn't save them. You and I can be raised all of our life and believe that Jesus died on the cross. That doesn't save us. No. You must believe, which means to entrust the heart, which means to entrust the life. Jesus laid down his life so that we could live. Therefore, what God's asking for us to do is to give our life back over to him. To submit our own will unto his will. To give our life to him. To entrust our life to him. So it starts with something as simple as praying a prayer, yes. But it has to be a prayer that is meant it has to be a prayer from the heart, not from the head. And when that prayer from the heart, not the head, is given unto God, something happens, man. A miracle takes place. A man is born again from the dead. He was born of the water of the flesh the first time, but now he's born of the spirit. And just like you don't know exactly where the wind comes from, I know we know now scientists say that there's wind shears up in. But the point is, is that when the Bible was written, man did not necessarily know exactly where the wind came from. Yet you could feel it. You could hear it hear it you could you you knew that it was real and when you truly get saved or born again you know it's real you know why because the holy spirit comes to live in your heart amen, amen. and things are never going to be the same we're talking about the blemish we're talking about the stain that prevents us from entering into the presence of god and how the enemy of your soul wants to hold that blemish on, put it, put it right there on your chest so that every time you look in the mirror, all you see is the stain, all you see is the blemish, and it's constantly trying to remind you that you're unworthy to get into the presence of God. But I'm here to tell you this morning that the first time you were born of Adam, you were born of water, but God had a plan. 
a spiritual rebirth. Look at this, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. See, after you're born again, something happens in the mind of God. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ. Well, how did you get in Christ? Well, I always like drawing this little picture. That the first time you were born, you were born like Adam. You were born in sin. You ever wondered why you walked around with such a frown on your face? So sad, so unhappy. I know sometimes I still got frowns, but guess what? I try to smile. <laughs> you know? I, I, I feel like I'm a, I'm a glass half full guy, but I realize that not. But listen. He's sad because he's born in sin. He's separated from the presence of God. And everything on this earth that he tries to find his happiness from is only temporary. But guess what? God had a plan. And the plan was the giving of his son to die on the cross for our sin. And when you put faith. See, when you heard the gospel and you put faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross, Jesus Christ and him crucified, a miracle happened where the Holy Spirit took you and put you in Jesus. That's what the Bible says over and over again. He put you in Jesus where in the mind of God, you rushed back to the cross 2,000 years ago and you died with Jesus. You were buried with him and just as he was raised from the dead, you too should walk in newness of life. And now you're in Christ. Amen. That's your new position. Yeah. You're in him. Amen. The passage of scripture right here in 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ. Every time you see in Christ, you should see this picture right here. You should see this pictograph of this old man born of Adam, born in sin, but now he's born again. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. His stain is gone. Amen. His blemish is gone. Amen. That which tried to prevent him from entering the presence of God is gone. Not because you did everything you were supposed to do just right. Not because you went to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night when they used to have it on Sunday night. Not just because you helped in the nursery and in the children's ministry. Not just because you got up on the stage and sang because of what Jesus did. Not because of what you did. Amen. The only thing that you were able to do was to take the faith that was given to you by God and to say, yes, God, I believe in your plan. This plan that you worked so hard to give to man, this your only begotten son, Jesus, that you gave to us to die for us. Yes, Lord, I believe with the faith that you've given me to trust in the plan of salvation. And when you did that in the mind of God, the old man that you were that had all that stain, all that blemish died in Christ, was buried with him and a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. And now he's in Christ. Amen. And now he's a new creature. He's been born again. He's a new creation in the eyes of God. All things, behold, all things. I'm sorry. He is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're new. Amen. Like a baby skin. I know I've preached on it so many times, even since we started this church, but on naming the leper. And how what a perfect type that is of our first birth in Adam. His skin was all leprous and infected. And then whenever the Lord, they told him to go dip in the Jordan when he was finally obedient. Because, see, that's what the gospel is. The gospel doesn't make a whole lot of sense to the, to the, to the logical or the intelligent mind. I remember, I remember the story well in the sense that they told him, the prophet told him to go dip in the Jordan River seven times. And he said, oh, no, the rivers of Jordan are much, uh, of, of Syria are much cleaner Far par, and I can't remember the other one. Uh, why would I want to go dip in the Jordan? Because the gospel may not make sense to you, but that's the way that God works. And when he dipped in the Jordan, the Bible says he came up and his skin was now like the skin of a baby. A new little baby. You ever, you ever seen a baby's bum? <laughs> you know? I mean, I still change diapers all the time. Well, I don't change them, but I, I got to check kids all the time in the clinic. Sometimes I help them change the diaper, whatever. The point being is this, is that the skin of a newborn baby. It's, it really doesn't have, well, I mean, sometimes that rash gets pretty bad, but the point I'm trying to make is that they don't really have a lot of blemish. It's soft. It's supple. It's new. Right? That's what you are when you get born again. You, you're like a, you're a new creation. Starting over with a new sleep. No stain. No blemish. 
But so often, even after we're born again, the memory of the stain remains. We don't feel new. We try to scrub our mind of the stains of the past from before we were saved. But we walk around feeling guilty or the guilt is from the stains that we get after we're born again. That we see when we look in the spiritual memory mirror and the enemy of our soul uses the memory of these stains to make us feel that we, were, we are unworthy of the presence of God. Many times people don't understand what it means to be justified by faith. To be, like what I'm trying to explain is, is that God went through all of this so that he could say that you're innocent. That's right. Yeah. Amen. I mean, that's how God sees you. If you're truly born again and you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's how God sees you. Amen. The enemy is going to work overtime to make you convinced that you're not innocent and he want, because he wants you to carry that cloud of guilt with you. The feeling of guilt from sin will cause you to not want to come to church, not want to read your Bible, not want to pray to God. When you walk around with that feeling of guilt, you begin to feel unworthy. You won't want to enter into praise and worship. You won't want to open up the Bible. You won't want to seek after the things of God because instead of feeling the liberty and the freedom that Jesus purchased for you, you will instead feel condemned. The Old Testament and New Testament is filled with mighty men of God that had stains that should have prevented them from moving on with God. Moses killed a man. Y'all remember that story? He killed an Egyptian. The Bible says he looked to the right, he looked to the left, he killed that man, and he, they buried him in the sand. It caused repercussions in his life. He stayed on the backside of the wilderness for 40 years waiting for God to develop him. And, but at the same time, when God was ready, God used him. David committed adultery with Bathsheba and then, her, and then had her husband murdered. Jacob deceived his father and stole his brother's blessing and his brother was tough. And for the next 21 years, Jacob ran in fear that his brother was going to find him. Peter denied Jesus three times on the night that he was crucified. All in all of these situations, the choices that they made caused a stain in their life and it affected them for a period of time. But guess what? God never gave up on them. God continued to move and operate in their lives. Yeah. And when the time was right, God used them. Satan's desire is to never let us forget the stains. He wants the blemish to remain on the forefront of our minds so that we always feel unworthy to be in God's presence. There's an Old Testament passage that I think speaks to this very well. If you go to Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It says uh, in Zechariah 3, verses 1 through 4, He showed me Joshua, the high priest. Now, just real quick. <laughs> now, what we're talking about right here, and I'm kind of shooting from the hip, but if I had to guess, we're talking somewhere around 600 to 500 B.C. Now. All right? So we're not talking about the Joshua that would have been somewhere around here after the Exodus when they entered into the promised land. Joshua, that fought the giants. We're not talking about him. We're talking about Joshua, a high priest. His name was Joshua, but he was a high priest. This is after the, the, the children of Israel have failed God, gone against God, and because of that have found themselves in Babylonian captivity. In other words, they were prisoners of their enemy. I always use this spiritually, that if the child of God has been liberated and set free, but then he continues to transgress the ways of God, his spiritual enemy will, will put him in bondage, just like Israel's enemy, Babylon, put them in bondage. The same story, written, the same, written multiple ways, time and again, to reveal to mankind God's plan. But in Zechariah 3, 1 through 4, God wants to restore his people at this point. He had promised them, even though you're going to go into bondage, I'm going to set you free. God wants to bring his people back to the land of Israel. He wants the temple rebuilt be so that his presence can be in Jerusalem so that his people can worship him. <clears throat> it says right here, and he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, in this particular passage of scripture, the angel of the Lord is a type of Jesus. And Satan also was standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord 
that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee? Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? What does that mean? It means that the fire of judgment was on Israel and that God was plucking her out of the fire of judgment. But Satan is standing there to resist the plan of God. Satan is standing there to resist the people of God. Satan is standing there to accuse the people of God. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. He was all stained up. He was full of stains. And he stood before the angel and he answered and spoke unto those that stood before him saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with the change of raiment. Here we see just another episode in the long history of Israel, the long history of God's people, where Satan is accusing them of being guilty, accusing them of being dirty. But what the Lord, the angel of the Lord says is that, No, you're not guilty, you're not dirty, you're being pulled out of the fire of judgment, the judgment of fire, right? And and and. and we're, there's an exchange that's taking place. We're going to take those old stained, filthy, dirty garments. We're going to remove them and we're going to give you some clean garments because that's what Jesus came to do. When you see it in the New Testament, the Bible says that the saints of God are clothed with robes of righteousness. Amen. They've been given the righteousness of Jesus. Once again, the high priest here. I mean, it's a perfect picture of what we've been talking about. The priest who who is supposed to have access to the presence of God, is being called guilty by Satan. And that's the same story that you and I, as priests and kings that have been redeemed, the enemy wants us to feel guilty. The accuser calls him guilty, but the angel of the Lord, which is a type of Christ, says that he's forgiven. It's important that we understand that in this life we're going to make mistakes. Sometimes the mistakes that we make are going to follow us for the rest of our lives. But God has a plan to remove the stain and restore us into his presence. In his presence there is hope for eternity. And also in his presence there is hope for today. Three things I want to talk to you about. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 25 through 27. Point number one, the love and commitment of God. You need to know that God loves you and that he's committed to you. Because when you walk around and the enemy of your soul wants to make you believe that that stain is just too big and that it can't be removed, God wants you to know that he's committed to you. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. In this passage of scripture, the relationship between husband and wife is connected specifically, God, it really is being used as an illustration to describe the relationship between Jesus and his bride. There's a closeness and an intimacy between a husband and a wife that doesn't exist in any other type of relationship. In other words, you know, if there's a spot of dirt somewhere, you, you know where it is. The good news is, is that Jesus isn't like us. Even though sometimes we see spots of dirt, we see blemishes, sometimes after a period of time, it can kind of start to, to wear off. Jesus isn't like that. He's committed. He never, he never changes. He's completely committed to this relationship. And let me tell you something. In the midst of this relationship, his love was sacrificial. He laid his life down for his bride. And also because he laid his life down, the close intimacy and the connection that there is between us and Jesus through the word of God, see, there's a, there's a script in this passage of scripture it says, by the washing of the water, sorry, washing of water by the word, the cleansing is taking place. God is love. God is committed to us. And I need you to understand something that the word of God, along with the Holy Spirit, allows a cleansing to take place. Even though there are stains and blemishes in our life, God wants you to know that he's cleansing you. There's a process that's taking place. The reason that I wanted to, to bring this up is, is because many times when you first get saved, I can get up here and I can talk to you for two hours and explain to you that you're justified, that you're innocent, that you're no longer guilty, that you don't have any stains, but you're not going to believe my words. You'll believe the word of the Lord whenever it's revealed to you. What I need you to know is, is that many times when you first get saved, you do still carry guilt from your past. But the longer you're in the faith, 
the more you learn about the word of God, the more the word of God begins to reveal to you that you are cleansed. Uh, you know, the, the best way I can describe it is, is that I've, I've, used, I've used this word before um, to describe it, enculturated. What does that mean? Well, to me, it means that that there's there, that you were raised, you were born into, and raised in a particular culture. You have to go back and think about your own home life, right? Because I can't plug plug it in for you because you you lived it, not me. And I've used the example before of my own life, how. You know, daddy was from Baton Rouge and he grew up in a family of a bunch of boys and they like to play football and fight and drink too much. Mama was from Lake Arthur and uh, they like to play cards late at night and drink too much. And then they, married, they got together and then I was born in all of that. And all of my life I was around them playing cards and drinking too much or hearing my daddy talk about how somebody was about to get a whoop. And you grow up and, that, and that's part of your enculturation. But then there's music involved. People don't like me talking about their music, but I'm just saying there's music involved because it enculturates you. It begins to formulate in your mind a message. The music that you start to connect yourself begins to enculturate you. I mean, I don't even know what's popular nowadays because I don't listen to... To worldly music, but I'm, I'm just saying that you think about the you think about your if you listen to secular music. I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm just saying if you listen to secular music, there are some songs that you like. You think of your favorite song, and you think of what it says. They're like, oh man, I ain't listening to no words. I just listen to the beat. Well, you need to start listening to the message of what they're saying. And you think about the lyrics to the song right now of your favorite song, and you tell me. Is it edifying God in your life? Does it build God up and say, God's on the forefront of my life. God's, in, 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 you know, he's the one that I'm looking to. Or is it enculturating you to a mindset of the world? Is it teaching you um, about, you know, back when I was growing up, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll, dude. You know, crash a beer can on your head or something. But, you know, that's how, oh yeah, man, it's cool. We're going to just party till we die. Like that was, you know, we were going to kill ourselves at the party. That's, that, that was the cool thing. And don't ask me why. I guess it's because everybody was singing about it. I'm on a highway to hell. I'm on a highway to hell, and guess what? My friends are going to be there too. Like we were just going to have this big party in hell. Come on, dude. But that's what we were being convinced. It's a, it's a lot. We were being enculturated. And all of these things begin to affect us in the way that we think. But what I'm here to tell you is that when you get saved... And you start to put the word of God in you. He begins to enculturate you according to his word. And it's a whole different kingdom, a whole different culture, a whole different mindset that he begins to reveal to you. He begins to reveal to you his character, his love, his commitment. And he begins to convince you, if you will let him, that you're no longer stained, that you're no longer have a blemish, and that you are worthy to enter into his presence. Not because of anything you did, but because everything that Jesus did, you start to trust that what God's word says is true, and he begins to relieve you of that burden that you've been carrying around Amen. all that time. Amen. That's number one. God is committed. He's a God of love. He's got a plan to cleanse us. Number two, he had no spots or stains, therefore you have eternity to gain. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. We're talking about eternity. But this is a good passage of Scripture. It's got a lot of good stuff in it. It says, But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, so what he's talking about is, is that Jesus is the, new, is the fulfillment of the high priest. And there's a fulfillment of the tabernacle that they used to see or the temple that they used to see. And it's not made with hands because this is the new living temple. Your body has become the temple of God. God's presence lived in the temple. Now your body has become the temple of God. He says, neither by the blood of bull of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in. Once into the holy place. Not through animal sacrifice, but instead he laid his own life down. Having obtained eternal redemption for us. 
For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, all these had to do with ceremonial cleansing, making the Old Testament sinner right with God. It says, to sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. See, you and I might have a blemish. You and I might have a spot. But Jesus had no spot on him. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. God wants to be able to purge your conscience. He doesn't want you. You know, that's part of the problem that people... <clears throat> people try to do a bunch of religious works because they still feel guilty. So they're trying to work their way past their guilt. But what the Bible's saying right here is he wants to purge your conscience from dead works. The dead works, you coming to church, you reading more Bible, you praying more, you trying to do all this stuff being involved in ministry is not going to purge your conscience of the past sin. Dead works aren't going to do it. Jesus came to shed his blood so that you would not have to try to... to, to Take care of it yourself. He came to do the work of the Lord. Amen. To purge your conscience. And you don't have to live. Now for them he was saying don't go back to Old Testament sacrifice. He was, that's who the, I believe the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. He was talking to the New Testament Christians who were now going back backwards back towards the Old Testament sacrifices. And the Apostle Paul saying don't go back to that. Don't go back to temple worship. Don't go back to the sacrifice of goats and calves. That, that, those, dead, those works are dead. They can't cleanse your conscience. It was the shedding of Jesus' blood that makes you whole. Anyway, he says, And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of transgressions, in other words, he paid for our sins, that were under the First Testament, the Old Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. I said all that to say this. Because he had no spots or stains, we have eternity to gain. That we might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. He offered himself as a sacrifice to pay the penalty of our sin. In the Old Testament, God used the nation of Israel as a, as a type to show us the way. He used the, the nation of Israel. He used the sacrifices to show us the shedding of blood and that it had to do with the forgiveness of sins. But animals couldn't restore man to God, but they could show the story that, that one day he would come. And with his own blood that was without spot because there was no stain in him, he would offer up his life as a sacrifice. God accepted that sacrifice. Amen. Therefore, his sacrifice was accepted by God to pay the penalty because like Adam was created without sin, Jesus died without sin. So the payment for man was, made, was paid. Because of what Jesus did, you and I can have eternal life. Because of what Jesus did, you and I can have eternal relationship with God. Sometimes on this earth you feel pain. Sometimes on this earth you, you, you don't understand what's going on. But this is temporary. Amen. This is a temporary circumstance that you're living right now. There's an eternity, amen, to gain. Number three, he removed our stains, and out of thankfulness, we should live unstained. 1 Peter 1, 17 through 21. He says, and if you call on the Father, this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 21. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. That part right there is what I really wanted you to see. Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. A sojourner is a pilgrim, a person on a journey. Peter, time and again, describes this life as a temporary state of mind, that you're on a pilgrimage, that you're on a journey. And he's saying that you need to pass your time on this journey here in fear. In other words, in reverence, you need to fear the Lord. You need to reverence God. You need to pay attention to how you walk this thing out. 
For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. In other words, God didn't use the currency of the world to buy you back from your empty life that you learned from your people before you. But instead, through the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Now I just put it down here. Don't let the devil make you feel unworthy, but also don't think that you can live your life any way you want. You were redeemed, which means to be bought back. Therefore, you belong to God now. And it means that you are to live your life in such a way that it pleases him. The good news is that God will give you the strength to live a life that is pleasing and unspotted. Go to James 127. We've got two scriptures and then we're going to close. James 127. It says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Now, I got to tell you that some people will read that and think that they need to go open up an orphanage and give half their check to a widow. Now, don't get me, but there's nothing wrong with if the Lord leads you to open up an orphanage and there's nothing wrong with giving half your check to a widow if that's what the Lord tells you to do. The idea behind that, though, is this. It's selflessness. A widow can't give you nothing in return. An orphan can't give you anything in return. Most times when people do work for the Lord, they want to be seen by men. They want a little attaboy pat on their back. It's not about really giving their life back to the Lord. See, Jesus gave his life for us. Now he's asking us to give our lives back to him. Ain't, there's not really any room for attaboys in this thing. And God desires for us to live our life selflessly. Many times we hinder ourselves we hinder our work for the Lord because we want to be recognized by men. God's not interested in anybody else in this show getting glory other than him. He wants our lives to bring glory to him. Amen. Any gift that he's given you isn't your gift after all. It was his gift and he's given it to you to use it as a steward. And the question is, are you going to be a good steward or a bad steward? Are you going to use your gift for the Lord? Or are you going to hold on to it? For yourself. Amen. God is saying pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to do this. To minister and give service unto God. Even in circumstances where nobody can pay you back. Listen, we live in the midst of a, of a church age where nowadays a lot of preachers don't want to do nothing for free. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to get somebody to do something for you, then you pretty much... Back in the day, whenever we first started preaching, and Aaron knows what I'm talking about, and Mike too, back in the day when we first started preaching, and Troy knows it too from coming to this church, when you preach, you look at it as an honor to be able to preach from behind the pulpit. We weren't out there asking for no offering, you know? But nowadays, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with giving an offering to the preacher. That's not what I'm saying. Apostle Paul said, don't muzzle the ox while he's treading out the ground. That's not the point. But when we first got our opportunity, especially when we knew we couldn't preach anyway, we were just grateful to be able to preach. I remember the days. We were grateful to be able to preach, right? It's selflessness, giving back to the Lord. The Lord gave to you. Amen. I don't know if you've ever felt the gratitude. Whenever you realize what Jesus did for you and you just want to give back to him. But I kind of went off on that. The main point I wanted you to see was also to keep himself unspotted from the world. The Lord wants us to be separate from the world. He does, if we get too close to the world, I'm telling you, I've been warning you this since we opened up this church three years ago. If you get too close to the world, you're going to get dirty. If you hang out with pigs in a pigsty, you're going to end up with mud all over you pick slop on you right i'm not gonna get into the prodigal son but y'all remember the story he woke up one day he's like what in the world am i doing well how did i end up in this mess if you hang out close enough to the world you're gonna get dirty and you're gonna get spotted up from the world but look at this jude 124 through 25 i want to leave you with this because guess what you can't do it on your own the word of god says for you to live an unspotted life but you can't do that on your own 
You, you, you can try all you want to. You can try to do it in your own strength all you want to, but you're going to keep failing time and again. But Jude 124 through 25 says this. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. He can present us faultless. That word there literally means a sacrifice without a spot or a blemish. You know how you can present us faultless? Because of this right here. That's right. Because you're in Christ. When the Father sees you, He sees Jesus. Hallelujah. He doesn't see your sinfulness. He doesn't see your blemish. He doesn't see your stain. He sees the unspotted Savior who died and shed His blood for you.